so there is an ignorant view of life the ordinary view of life and that won't be a problem but the problem is we think it is the ultimate view of life and the fact is if we don't engage with yoga we live with this view and we die with this view and that that's really a tragedy but there is another view of life and we can exchange that view provided we are willing to give this and in return we can have that this is the but if we don't we are not willing to leave this view we can't have that view this is the exchange offer of, of god original exchange offer give the old take the new away but we have to do that this this is the uh, what is called in in the gita as the law of sacrifice where when you give we give our ignorant ways and in our ignorant ways what we get in return is something else completely different in the ramayana it is revealed in a very beautiful way in a small little story and the story is that when rama has to cross the river because he is banished from his kingdom into the forest the ignorant view is see look you know how bad it is and the king is bad and this has happened he was a nice prince poor fellow bad destiny etc etc and so he is going to cross the river like an ordinary mortal so he has to hire someone a boatman to carry him but the boatman has a different view he knows that he is not an ordinary mortal he is looking like one but he is able to see something else behind and he says i am not going to let you on the boat unless i wash your feet and rama would not allow it so he says no no i must wash your feet because i believe i have heard that when you touched your feet to a stone she it turned into a woman now my fear is that if you step on my boat and the boat turns into a woman i will have two women and no source of livelihood <laughs> a very beautiful little story so i can't afford that state please allow me to wash your feet because i'll wash the magic away so he says okay so he washes the seeming magic away and when he sits in the boat rama says you know see we are sanyasis now we can't pay anything and sita insists no 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 we will we can pay i have got my ring and we can give this gold ring to this man so rama says okay you try and the boat man is refusing so eventually sita says why are you refusing is this less it's a ring of gold you can test it you know that we are from the king's house we are not going to give you something inferior of course she doesn't say in so many words but that is how we would think and the boatman says something very remarkable he says no you are putting me into a bad bargain so what is the good bargain he says very simple basically we are in the same profession i don't want to take money from you so what do you want very simple exchange offer i am doing your job of making you cross a physical river you do your job of making me cross the bhav sagar the ocean of life so, so there is this original exchange offer of god where we give the old consciousness in return he gives us the new consciousness because in the kingdom of god this doesn't work we may think oh it is too much like you know my recent russia experience so i was carrying dollar in my pocket and i thought a ah, dollar means i can get anything just go to the counter and pay in dollars and people are very happy they'll give me bottle of water or cup of tea and always it worked like that but when i went in russia i was very thirsty asked them to give a bottle of water and he said 100 rubles so this is fine so i took out my dollar and said this won't work okay you take it and give me the rubles exchange no sir you have to you should have exchanged it there <laughs> it was a strange experience which taught me yoga in a very interesting way not the equanimity part but i remembered oh we do the same mistake we don't exchange it where we should have exchanged it so i had no choice myself and my friend sushil but to endure thirst we said 
nobody would exchange the dollar for a ruble and it was not india where you can always go and say yaar you know i am bit thirsty thoda pani chahiye somebody will surely you know <laughs> out of compassion with all the whatever we may say somebody will surely give us some water to drink <laughs> it's a good deed so we could, we maybe somebody would have given but we didn't dare to ask so we said maybe you know we have to just endure the thirst so similarly we have the exchange offer where we have to exchange dollar may be very valuable otherwise but it has no value in that place so we may be very valuable to the world lot of degrees money wealth position prestige but it has no value when it comes to real things it has to be exchanged and exchanged in time not when we are old enough past the security gates of death tooth have fallen one leg is already in the grave and we say please exchange it too late sir you should have done it before entering the security zone now you have the doctor's health card with you you are past the security zone now live with it endure it remember god take the name of god that well he is there he will take care of your thirst in his own mysterious ways so this is the first view that god is hidden above there is darkness all around but there is another view this is not the final view and that is why it's so dangerous sometimes to quote sri aurobindo because unless we have the context and the background it can be so badly misquoted look these four lines which we read can be like a summary statement above us there is the super conscious god below there is the inconscient around us in a ignorance sound so perfectly true but when we read the very next line but this is only matters first self view then the whole thing collapses this is how we normally see and experience things god is hidden above when we are still too much entranced by matter we cannot see the living presence which is right next to us or was always there it's like a child who is busy playing and doesn't know that his mother is around and he is busy with his friends busy watching the television program he has forgotten completely his his mother so what happens the moment the child gets hurt mama where are you and mama comes running i am here i was always there my child and the child feels rash oh you are here i didn't know i thought you have vanished you know children go through this phase that's why they cry when they are little babies if suddenly the mama goes even for a moment they think she is gone forever so she has to come back again and again to for the child to develop an enduring idea that my mother really never vanishes same thing happens with the divine when we are in the infancy of the soul if we don't see we think he is not there so again and again we have to go through little twists of the ankle and this way and that way and the mama comes and after a while the child knows yes if i call mama comes that means she is there actually she is there always there but we don't see and acknowledge and we have to go through this phase so that means we are still in the infancy of the soul but the fact is on the same page we see a little below truth made the world not a blind nature force again as i said one of those very powerful lines to always always remember when appearances are clouded we cannot see the next step in front when all is confusing and confused and we feel that really some cruel person has created this world we must remember this truth made the world not a blind nature force so then people ask this question but what about that moment we are not able to see so the answer is try to see and see why we do not see try to understand what is truth's game in this process rather than drawing a immediate conclusion based on surface appearances and that's what yoga teaches us and then on the next page page 485 where we had stopped there are greatnesses hidden in our unseen parts that wait there are to step into life's front divine sees these as parts we do not see that's why you see when sadhaks judge each other 
इट्स ए मिजरेबल पैथेटिक जजमेंट मोस्ट क्रिटिकल बिटर कॉस्टिक ओ लुक एट दैट पर्सन ही क्लेम्स टू बी ए साधक बट वेन गॉड सीज ही डजेंट सी दैट पार्ट ही सीज द बटरफ्लाई हिडन इन साइड द कैटापिलर सो मदर से इज माई चाइल्ड आई ऑलवेज लुक अपवर्ड्स टूवर्ड्स ट्रूथ एंड ब्यूटी एंड लाइट इट्स नॉट दैट शी डजेंट नो अवर लिटल और बिग स्टूपिडिटी शी नोज इट but this is the beauty of the divine that she sees what is not yet born we see that which is right now visible to our eyes but she sees something else and it is there in her conception you know sometimes when people do an ultrasound of a baby in the womb see the different levels of seeing you see yes the it's living not living so this is the only thing it's a living piece but tell it to a mother who is carrying the baby she will be shocked to hear such a insensitive cruel statement you call it a living flesh that's all you don't know all my hopes and dreams are here in this darkness so this is how there are two different levels of seeing so what is that other seeing there are greatnesses hidden in our unseen parts and the purpose of yoga is to bring them out we feel a need from deep indwelling gods with a capital g the original gods not those who have now whom we worship one speaks within light comes to us from above our soul from its mysterious chamber acts so how does it act very fact that we are all here is a sign that it acts <laughs> why what we may have 101 reasons but it pushes us pushes us gently giving this reason that reason and eventually brings us to a place where we should come there's so many people with very interesting experiences i know who have come and suddenly visiting the samadhi they have cried and cried feeling that we have come home this sense of coming home what is it that makes us feel we have come home it is this what is it that holds us to yoga despite everything going toxic topsy turvy it is this it acts from the mysterious chamber it does not allow us and there are so many beautiful stories the story the other day of sahanadi you know when she came in such a beautiful way such lovely dreams experiences she had darshan of shirobindo before coming here and then she after staying here you have to you know all the challenges and the difficulties from within did come outside and we have to negotiate through them so once he decide no no i am going to go i i can't stay here she decides that i am going to go so mother asks her only one thing sahana you really want to go starts crying no mother <laughs> so in spite of all these challenges you stay on huta di packs her bag i am going to go and vasudha ben comes and asks her mother has asked me to ask you do you really want to go yes yes i want to go second time do you really want to go yes i am saying baba see i am packing the bags mother has asked me to ask you do you want to go no i am not going anywhere tell her it's interesting that other parts are saying a different story they are singing a different tune but there is something in us which holds on and that something is our soul from its mysterious inner chamber acts just at the right moment it steps and says don't be a fool of your mind and your vital stay this is your place and this is your work its influence pressing on our heart and mind pushes them to exceed their mortal selves the mind says no i can't take it anymore this is just too much the heart says i can't i can't bear it anymore this not what i had bargained for but what does the soul say no exceed yourself you had not bargained for it yes i know that but you are meant to do something much greater exceed yourself 
So it helps us to exceed. It seeks for good and beauty and for God. Even when its opposite is everywhere, still the soul seeks and has faith in good and beauty and God. We see beyond self's walls our limitless self. We gaze through our world's glass at half-seen vasts. We hunt for the truth behind apparent things. And a few lines below. When she enters into our house of outward sense, wisdom, it's a description of wisdom. So it's just like the rising sun when it enters into the house. Then we look up and see above her sun a mighty life self with its inner powers supports the dwarfish modicum we call life. It can graft upon our crawl two puza wings. Even in the most uh, spontaneous reflexes of the body, it is there. You know, when light comes in the morning and we open the eyes because of the light, instinctively we first look towards the light. Then the other reflex, alarm clock, clock, curtain if you want to pull, but instinctively. And if you are in a bad dream, we suddenly wake up. This little modicum called life, what we call life, that's not life. And suddenly, graft puts on us two wings from something from outside and from our crawl it puts two puza wings and that's where the hope lies and now we continue our body's subtle self is throned within in its viewless palace of veridical dreams there are these all kinds of dreams that we are conditioned to when children are born, parents say, ah, he has come to fulfill my dreams. First falsehood. First dose of falsehood is given by parents. It's a very sad thing to say. But, well, it's true. This child is a means to aggrandize my ego. They don't say in so many words. When we will grow old, he will look after us. He will fulfill our dreams. I could not own a Mercedes, but surely one day he will get a job. NRI and buy for me a car which I could not own. These are false dreams. And half our life we struggle with these dreams. Then the school teacher puts another dream. You know 99.99% those nightmarish dreams. <laughs> then society puts another dream. You have to be successful. People must respect you. But these are not the real dreams. Our real self sits unseen into its palace. Veridical dreams, truth dreams, truth imaginations, dreams of an ideal world, dreams of beauty and light and truth manifest. Dreams of a love that never dies. Dreams of peace and bliss and unity where all is strife and struggle and division and hatred. These are the true dreams, veridical dreams. that are bright shadows of the thoughts of God. Thoughts of God are true perceptions. Later on they change into thoughts as they say. How does God look at this world? In the prone, obscure beginnings of the race, the human grew in the bowed, ape-like man. He stood erect, a godlike form and force. Oh, what a beautiful example. The ape is always a little bit bowed. And he holds within him human. And the sign of his humanness, very strangely, even science gives this term, homo sapiens erectus. Before that we don't have the word erectus. We have various varieties of homo sapiens. For those who believe or who doubt the supramental creation, 
it would be good to look at our own history. There were ten subtypes of human or humanoids between ape and man. Nine washed away. They are very interesting terms for them. I have forgotten now. Cro-Magnon man, Australopithecus sounds almost like another dinosaur. Neanderthal. Some of them fought terribly, almost killed each other. And we have different varieties. Ultimately, they've all vanished like intermediate species. Mother speaks of between the man and the superman, many intermediate species, which will probably fight and die <laughs> till they exhaust completely the fighting instincts. But they will come with greater and greater powers and light. It's bound to grow. That was a more difficult step from ape to man, accomplished through nine failures. Each failure was a step towards the great becoming. Till the recognition that yes, it's no more an ape. See, things change. This became a thinker's brow. And man stood erect and the thumb changed its position. So Homo sapiens erectus, Sri Aurobindo refers to that. It starts from prone beginnings. It's lying almost on four, then stands half and then fully erect. He stood erect, a godlike form and force. So people who say that man has built God into his image. There are a lot of debate about anthropomorphism. Oh, you see, all gods are like, you know, built like human beings. I'm not saying the ZTV type of stuff where gods are worse than human beings. You know, even sometimes with a moustache and beard, <laughs> you never see a barber there. But that apart. But man is being built in the image of a god. That is the subtle truth. It's just inverting the whole thing. Yes, when man was more animal-like, the gods were also animal-like. We see certain ancient traditions in Greece and Egypt where animals, uh, gods are like animals. Horus, one of the sun god, what form he has of a bird. So you have all kinds of these gods. But when man grew, he started dreaming of uh, those gods who really want to express. So his body began to express it and he began to grow into the image of the gods. That's why we don't like to hold a stick and probably, you know, bend. <laughs> it's probably a sign that we are relinquishing our godlike status and stature. And one of the signs that we have relinquished it when we become spineless. And we don't have the courage to stand up for what we believe in. So that is another kind of step, you know, being erect before the world forces. So here we have sign of manhood. He is to erect a godlike form and force. So not just the form but the force. And his soul's thoughts looked out from earthborn eyes. And once again we see man stood erect. He wore the thinker's brow. So we see the brow which is in the apes the brow is very different. You'll see this arch which is too much. There is very little as if this very narrowed down. But this has started expanding. And so these arches receded and this is the thinker's brow. So what will be the brow of the future man? It's very interesting. I was reading an interesting article that you know there are different ways man is evolving. So they have done studies and reached a very interesting conclusion that which type of human being is evolving faster, adapting faster and really evolving and they discovered those who have learned to cooperate and help each other. It's a very strange thing. Like they have found people who carry gratitude and forgiveness. It itself is healing in its own right. Those who practice gratitude and forgiveness, it heals them of many things. And those who hold within bitterness and, oh, I'll never forget this, some, somebody had done. It's like a poison. And similarly, those who help each other and cooperate, they have a better evolutionary possibility. This is hardcore science. So this part is still evolving. Scientists say that the prefrontal cortex is still evolving. So the thinker's brow, this is where the consciousness began to work to evolve man. He looked at heaven and saw his comrade stars. They are not far away to be frightened. 
they are my friends my comrades i can equal them i can go past them so he began to dream of that a vision came of beauty and greater birth slowly emerging from the hearts chapel of light I just love this line you know this is the chapel the original temple hearts chapel of light uh, it's good that other temples were only devices <laughs> they were when this is not lit up then we have that but when this is lit up we don't need it anymore you know there is a story of guru nanak sleeping with his feet towards mecca and someone tells him are you a fool your feet is towards mecca she so say i don't know about that anyways you put it wherever you want wherever there is not mecca so they he puts his feet to another side and he says are you sure you have put me in the right direction yes so he looks back and sees again mecca is there and so on and so forth till he discovered that wherever he puts his feet there is mecca so it's a obviously a story an instructive story that these external aids were necessary for man's progress at some point of time but man is entering the age of yoga when these aids will no more be necessary and we will discover it inside us just as when we are children we discover our physical parent they are help ultimately it is only the divine who acts through them and every other agency but we don't value him we often say oh my parents are greater than god it's so foolish but it's okay man loves his folly but the sign of growth is when you discover the true parent who was always there with you before this body and who will be there beyond this body and the physical parents were may only a very shadowy expression of that only temporarily who came into the picture but the real parents are there always there but when we have not discovered them we need to lean upon something external but they are only representative so here we have something very similar the heart chapel of light and moved in a white lucent air of dreams he saw his beings unrealized vastnesses he aspired and housed the nascent demigod demigod is immortal growing into god in typical scriptures we have when a god and a human come together for example we have the story of bhishma or we have the story of achilles they are demigods because the mother is a goddess and the father is the immortal in both the instances so they are demigods they harbor within themselves something of the godhead these stories are very interesting so man also is actually though we don't realize it he is a demigod he has something given by mother earth and earth nature but he also has something which comes from the heights which is called as the heavenly psyche but when we forget it then we forget our godhood or the godhead within us but when we discover it then we discover that this is there is a nascent demigod we are all potential demigods it is not a privilege only of achilles and bhishma it's a privilege given to every human being and we discover it as we grow closer and closer into our psychic essence out of the dim recesses of the self the occult seeker into the open came he heard the far and touched the intangible so slowly as man grows the seeker steps out heard the far intangible what is intangible when we are totally clouded with matter we don't know where is god where is divine the samadhi of shurbindra and the mother appears like stone slabs <laughs> but when this inner sense awakes it is a living presence it throbs with those particles of supramental light how do we feel it we feel it by a soul sense so the intangible that which was not tangible so very often people say oh i don't feel naturally so how do i feel not with these senses the more the being becomes subtle the more we grow into the soul sense the more we'll know it and experience it and feel it 
nobody has to tell us that there is grace the more we grow into the soul the more we experience grace to an extent when everything will become grace the smallest details of life will be an act of grace and people will think we are mad and we'll be so fortunate in our madness it's <laughs> we'll thank god that you made me a little bit of mad <laughs> make me completely mad there is a beautiful poet in urdu who says this why you know become the wine and the beaker and the jar become intoxicated mad in the bliss of the unknown so this is the this what begins to happen he gazed into the future and the unseen he used the powers earth instruments cannot use what is this power which can gaze into the unseen which earth instruments cannot use mind cannot use mind doesn't have that power mind as the either constructs or analysis or reason life gusto impulse desire body obscurity dullness inertia stability fixity but there is a power which can look into the far unseen future and it resides in the soul and it is faith that which the mind mocks at is actually the power given to us and of course faith is not a belief system of the mind mind can construct a belief system and trap faith faith is a light of the soul which shows us something which is unseen it shows the future a past time made of the impossible wow what a line what does faith do for faith there is nothing like impossible it makes it a past time a play thing oh something looks impass- impossible oh good i'll play with this for a while past time so after a while it doesn't matter whether you know if you have done with the play you say oh, okay okay i don't care for it i am one with the divine mother and i go and sleep in her arms so it's a past time made of the impossible he caught up fragments of the omniscient thought he scattered formulas of omnipotence thus man is in little house made of earth's dust grew towards an unseen heaven of thought and dream looking into the vast vistas of his mind on a small globe dotting infinity so we have these two views of man one is the material view so in the material view you know sometimes these are those we see those images of space and it's a sobering view when man lives only in the material side it's very sobering that who are we so we see our house then it enlarges city country then earth then solar system then the galaxy already earth has become a dot and then someone puts an arrow and says you are here <laughs> this is a sobering view but there is another view of man though it's a little dot but there is something else man can if he wants become the dwarf with the triple stride go beyond whatever he can even conceive of as a cosmos and he is meant to do that at last climbing a long and narrow stair he stood alone on the high roof of things and saw the light of a spiritual sun long and narrow stair it doesn't come easily there is a long period when we are just climbing and we yet cannot see the sun and we have to still go on go on go on sometimes it's narrow stifling nobody is there with us we are alone and still we must press on push on till a time comes and the sun becomes visible aspiring he transcends his earthly self he stands in the largeness of his soul new born redeemed from encirclement by mortal things this is the second birth of the soul new born first birth is in matter so everything is colored by matter it believes so oh, this is my parent this is my life i am this man with this surname i am this 
nationality i am this religion i am this caste i am oh, this matters first it's to navigate through life but then we are new born into the spirit that was what was called as becoming a dwij this is the starting point of yoga that we are new born when this old identities begin to lose their grip mother says so beautifully that to discover the soul we must discover in us that which is independent of the of time and space and the circumstances and conditions of our birth we must find that it is freed from that because it has assumed many names and forms it has lived in many countries and climes so we must discover that redeemed what a beautiful word from the encircling encirclement by mortal things what happens because we are seeing all around mortal things therefore we develop that we are also mortal because matter shows us all the time that forms are being born and destroyed everything is being destroyed our bodies are also destroyed we are encircled by mortal things death is all the time reminding us from every side but behind this reminder of death there is another reminder unfortunately we discover it when the body has gone to pieces so you know there is in indian this thing a tradition that when a dead person is taken on the shoulders of four people it could be three or two it doesn't matter basic thing is four is because of the four sides <laughs> nothing <laughs> secret about it but there is a very interesting line that is repeated ram naam satya hai god alone is true <laughs> we unfortunately learn it <laughs> when it's too late if this was taught to us when we were little babies then we would have been better off i don't know why this most crucial lesson the most important lesson of our life is given at the end of life so this is the most beautiful lesson you know the story of a little boy whose school was after crossing a forest so he told his mother i am very afraid everybody's papa and mama comes to leave them or some brother at least or an auto rickshaw at least but i have to go alone through this thick forest no normal parents would have just wept and said you know fate cruel god destiny or would have said don't worry i am also going to buy a scooter i'll leave you etc etc but this lady told this little boy a very beautiful thing he said no you know you don't know you have a brother he lives in the forest <laughs> you call him he'll come to your help shall say really yes yes what is his name he is a gopal so he goes into the forest and next time he's get calls go gopal and gopal comes and goes and days pass on mother had told that you know it's like getting rid of fear he knows my brother is there he will call no gopal will come but at least he will feel gopal is around like psychologists think it's a trick but he, you know after some time mother notice not only fear has gone this boy is so happy looks so contented he is doing very well in school everything so he says i am very happy and pleased with you but what happened he says oh you know that boy my brother gopal now he teaches me maths he does everything for me you know mom what a marvel thank god you told me about him oh you mean gopal he he came really came of course he came <laughs> so so one is a mental way of knowing it gopal is there okay you know psychologically but there is another experience of the soul ask of any one who have, has trod this life and they will tell you yes mother is more concrete than our own self we can doubt our body we can doubt our existence but we cannot doubt her she comes at every call this is a real experience of the growing soul so here we have redeemed from the encirclement by mortal things and moves in a pure free spiritual realm this realm is not elsewhere it's right here in the same forest of life we are surrounded by her presence how beautifully shobindo puts it and when the grace and protection of the divine mother is there with you what is there that can touch you and whom need you fear even in little of it will carry you through all dangers and difficulties whether they come from this world or from worlds invisible this is an experience of going through this 
forest of life, not elsewhere. Spiritual realm is not in some distant space. It's here, a space which we have forgotten to enter and live in. God always walks by our side, but that little child, we are busy with the gadgets and gizmos and when God comes to give the plate of food, we say, okay, okay, leave it here. Mother wants to feed with her own hand. No, no, mom, don't you see I'm busy? <laughs> it doesn't even look. I'll eat it. And poor mom, she has to go away. Try all kinds of tricks. And she suffers because the boy is eating cold food. That's the prayer of the mother. No, since man refused the meal that I have prepared for him, I gave it back to you, O Lord. This is our tragedy. Because we are so busy with gadgets, gizmos, the television of life, not that television. Original television is created by nature. And so we don't see the hands mother is coming and feeding us through so many hands. That is the beauty. As in the rare breath of a stratosphere, a last end of far lines of divinity, he mounts by a frail thread to his high source. He reaches his fount of immortality. He calls the Godhead into his mortal life. Then a time comes when we discover it as if by a frail thread. Look at the line. We are connected with life but through something everything else is gone but there is to be some excuse to be connected. You know, when a person is entering close to this discovery for the sake of remaining tied to earth sometimes small little flaws, imperfections are kept to keep the person held on to earth. A very beautiful two stories. One of Sri Ramakrishna and another of Swami Vivekananda. So Sri Ramakrishna was very, was very fond of prawn pakodas. Even before he has to talk, he would go and ask Shardama, are they ready or not? So somebody who saw only that part will say, oh, he is attached to prawn. He is not attached to prawn. He has to keep himself attached to something. Otherwise he won't stay upon earth. He had tied, same happened when Sister Nivedita comes with Vivekananda, tells Hardama, what is this man? I don't understand him. What you don't understand, my child? He is so vast when he talks about Brahman, reality. We feel he is fathomless, infinite. But tell a word against his country, he comes to blows. It looks he is going to give a punch into the face. He gets so angry. I can't believe he is the same Vivekananda. So he said, oh, you don't understand this. Long back, just to keep him tied. And he can't be tied by small things. So, Divine Mother has put a little, little bit of, you know, illusion, just to make him tied. Otherwise, you know, he will run away. The day he, know, he knows who he is, he won't stay. But he has a work to do. <laughs> Sri Ramakrishna had told him, I am not going to tell you who you are. If I tell you, you will vanish. Finish this work. And when he had done his work, he actually told few days before his departure that now I know who I am. Few days later, he passed away. So, we are tied. So, what ties us? Frail thread. Now we are tied with iron chains. Slowly, these iron chains give way to silver chains, then golden chains, and eventually become frail threads. They can be snapped if you wish. But otherwise, they keep us tied to earth nature because of a purpose and that purpose is he calls the Godhead into his mortal life. All this the spirit concealed had done in her. Now Shobindu connects it to Savitri's yoga. She had already reached this point. This high point of the journey where already through many many experiences in this life and others just a little frail thread kept her tied. Otherwise, she was already facing the spiritual sun, climbing the rooftops of nature. And when she discovers it, a portion of the mighty mother came into her as into its own human part. Mother says at one place, the recognition of me as the divine mother should come at the end of a journey, not at the beginning. It's very interesting. 
the moment you recognize who she is that means a totally a new dimension has started otherwise one does effort believes in all kinds of things but a time comes when eventually you discover oh this is she of whom the world has heard each easy miracle of felicity of a transmuting heart the alchemy is this comes after much preparation we know that story of kapali shastri that he had done many sadhanas tantra sadhana yoga japa mantra and someone asked him when he was on his deathbed what did you discover with all these sadhana what did you realize tell us in few words and he said something very interesting oh what do you mean what i found with these sadhanas they brought me to the feet of the divine mother it's not a joke we take it for granted it's a grace of grace that we have reached at her feet and if this is the end of the world play then world play is worth it <laughs> so this is the point she had reached the identification with the mighty mother amid the cosmic workings of the gods it marked her the center of a wide drawn scheme that's why it is said in the bible many are called few are chosen it doesn't mean that others are left all for good but it means that they will also be chosen and the point of being chosen comes then when her hand touches us and it marks us the center of a wide drawn scheme so many people interpret this phrase in a very egoistic way and everybody then begins to believe i am the chosen one so beware when people say you are the chosen one close the eyes <laughs> all are eventually chosen but first we are called and then chosen and then not even chosen but we are just hers so that's it dreamed in the passion of her far seeing spirit to mold humanity into god's own shape and lead this great blind struggling world to light god like passion now moves her no more escape no more nirvana no more just a small little exit door no more spiritual experiences people are very attracted to them fascinated they even compare notes what experience did you have what did i have spirituality is not a field of comparisons in as if you know we are in a company where god is writing our annual confidential report it's absurd what experience i had or didn't have who had more who had less we are here for a work and everything else is secondary and subordinated to serve god here this is a great privilege gods can't do it and that's why the love of god is not complete unless it's translated into translates into service of god here upon earth doesn't the mother say in savitri thy servitudes on earth are greater king than all the glorious liberties in heaven and when this awakes in us this impulsion we started with this divine project we can call it project savitri so we are part of that project experiences are not important they will come and go but the real thing is to participate with sincerity in this project and what is this project to mold humanity into god's own shape this is the work given to us first within us and then all that is around us and lead this great blind struggling world to light or a new world discover or create earth must transform herself and equal heaven or heaven descend into earth's mortal state this is the god like impulse why should there be only heavens there rare privilege this should transform and become heaven this is the work we are here to do so people say all this is very nice but how to do it and here comes the first master stroke the first great step of yoga the first thing we have to do the key to this change but for such vast spiritual change to be out of the mystic cavern in man's heart the heavenly psyche must put off her veil 
and step into common nature's crowded rooms and stand uncovered in that nature's front and rule its thoughts and fill the body and life. So this is like the experience when we go in a marriage. Nobody has seen the bride. She is hidden. The bridegroom, the groom is known because he is coming on a donkey in Indian traditions. Horse. It's almost like a donkey. <laughs> or maybe donkey sitting on a horse <laughs> thinking himself to be a king because he has a sword in his hand which he can't even lift. Forget about using it. <laughs> but one day is king. After that he will be a little slave. So he is coming. And there is hullabulu and everybody, oh this, look at this girl's dress, look at that boy's Oh, he thinks so much for himself and the food and everything. You know, it's a typical example. And then they enter into the grand royal hall. And then they are waiting. Where is the bride? Where is the bride? They are meanwhile discussing, looking at food. This paneer is good. That is suddenly the bride steps. And, you know, there is a word which, oh, you know, no, you know, she has come, she has come. Everybody, oh, where is she? Where is she? Now nobody is looking at each other's dress. They are looking at her. And she looks exceedingly beautiful. More beautiful than all the rest. They have forgotten how good their looks was. And they are enamored by the looks of the bride who stands on the threshold. All eyes have now turned towards her. Nobody has to tell them that keep quiet, keep your plates on the table. Because the bride is there. So similarly when the heavenly psyche steps into common nature's crowded rooms and fills them with its thoughts and power and breath, then everything undergoes a change. We can stop here, but since there are just few lines, let us finish it. We will come back to this, these lines. It shows the state in which we must be when we take to this path of yoga. It is not just a joke. It is something of seriously delightful nature <laughs> in grim earnest. Obedient to a high command, she sat. She has been given the command of yoga. Not all get this call, this invitation. But when we get it, thighs go to those who are strong and ready yet waste the force and misuse the moment. Obedient to high command, she sat. Time, life and death were passing incidents. The state of an yogini is no more than bothered because he must first discover that light with which we can understand the incidents of life. Not the, oh, such a good man died. Oh, such a wicked man is prospering. We don't have the light to see. Time, life and death were passing incidents, obstructing with their transient view her sight. Her sight that must break through and liberate the God imprisoned in the visionless mortal man. The inferior nature born into ignorance still took too large a place, it veiled herself and must be pushed aside to find her soul. So we'll stop here and continue tomorrow.